Good morning. Good to be with you guys. Looking forward to continuing our message series going through the book of Galatians. This woman was barren for many, many years. She wasn't able to have kids. Uh, She had no clue until she got married and started trying to have kids and uh, realized year after year, decade after decade, no kids. And she was devastated. Her husband was devastated. Uh, She lived in a culture that said, if you're not able to have kids, then you must have something wrong with you. You must have sin in your life. You must uh, be doing something that's not pleasing to God, and God must be judging you. Uh, This woman, after 90 years, named Sarah, finally had a baby. Some of you may know, may not know the story of Abraham and Sarah, but in the ancient cultures, they really believed that if a woman wasn't able to have a child then there must have been sin or flaw connected to her. They really believed and placed a lot of value for women uh, in their ability to have kids. And so their value, their righteousness, they were accepted by God, was based off of childbearing and childrearing, raising children. That thought process bled into the scriptures and the Israelite people. It didn't start with the Israelite people but it bled into the Israelite culture. And so in the Old Testament, you'll see there's six different women that were barren, and you'll see the pressure and the weight that's placed on them in regards to having children or raising children. And as a consequence, there was lots of of pressure, weight. I mean, can you imagine being that woman and not able to have children and you're in your 30s, 40s, and you're wondering, was it when I did this? Was it because of this in my life? And just questioning, why am I not able to have children? When ultimately, today we understand more of God and his nature, that's probably not connected to that at all. So the good news about the whole situation is that God redeems. God redeems every situation in our lives. Jesus redeems all situations. Now, that seems like an absolute statement, right? Um, Some of us might be sitting here with ailments, hurts, uh, pains, conflict, situations that we've blamed God for, and then we see a guy standing on a stage kind of, and saying that Jesus redeems all situations. And I believe he does. Now, this doesn't mean we will experience that full redemption while our heart is beating on earth. But I do believe the God who controls all things, who's the God of justice, chapter 3 of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, you get to chapter 3, and God says, I will bring justice to all injustices. All the broken things, all the wrong things, I will fix. I believe that. We just might not experience it on this side of eternity. We've been going through a series in Galatians. We want to, and we value studying the scriptures. We're going through the whole book of Galatians. I'll give you guys some time right now. There's yellow Bibles in the crates around. Feel free to be like at home. If you're by a yellow Bible or a crate, offer it to people who may not have a Bible in their hands. We will be in the scriptures at length today. We've been going through Galatians. We're all the way into chapter 4. Um, The last several verses, we're reading 10 verses today. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 31. And last time we were in Galatians, last week we had a little discussion weekend where we discussed what we were learning. And we do that every three to four weeks or so. We discuss to make sure we're learning or hearing what uh, the scriptures are saying. And so we go a little deeper on the passages 
a couple weeks ago, we looked at Paul um, reminding the Galatian church communities because the book of Galatians was not written just for a specific church community. It was a bunch of congregations, if you will, in the Galatia area. And so this letter circulated through that area and it was for all of them. And Paul has been, in the, in the last couple of weeks, Paul was highlighting, when you first met me, you first received me, I was, I had ailments, you helped me, you blessed me, you served me, you had joy. There was gratitude when you received this message of the gospel. And he was just sharing this and you guys were sacrificial. And now you're not. What happened? What ended up happening was within this area, there was false teachers who came behind Paul and they were teaching this these groups of congregations that they actually have to obey the law of Moses to receive Jesus. Those false teachers convinced many, many, many people that they had to do, they had to work to receive the free gift of God. And Paul got wind of that, so he's writing this letter to the church communities in Galatians say, that's a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You do not have to do to receive God's grace and love and so um, that weekend we talked about what we believe matters the Galatian body believed the truth of the grace of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ and at that time there was a response of generosity of joy of gratitude but their belief in the gospel shifted because of the false teachers so the importance of us evaluating what we believe is very very important so we talked about that a couple weeks ago Paul is continuing, uh, I'm going to say in this way, Paul's continuing on a rampage. Paul is on a rampage. He started this rampage in the middle of chapter 2, and he's on fire. He's in fuego, and he is going, and he's continuing to go after this body, saying, I can't believe you were living this way. I can't believe you were once free. Now you're living in bondage. And so he's continuing that thought. So if you've been part of our series for any time, you've heard me share same kind of thing because he's been on the same rampage for two and a half chapters. And so chapter five, Brother Kevin is going to give a different topic, different word, because Paul gets off his soapbox and he shifts into something different in chapter five. But we close in chapter four, we close this idea of where he's been running with this topic about freedom and law, slavery, law and promise. And he's, he's talking about these as parallels. And so today he goes into two births. And to be honest, this is a very deep passage. He goes into an illustration and he says this, but there's so much more underneath it for the people who received it. So I'm going to try really hard to simplify what he's talking about in, 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 the, in our passage today. And so Paul highlights two births, uh, one child, one child from one woman and another woman, the same father. This goes back to Abraham, goes back to Abraham. And I'll explain the story. Yep, I know, that doesn't do the right math, right? But if you read the Bible, you know it's full of broken people who do uh, messed up things. Um, and what's beautiful about that is God redeems all situations. That's what's beautiful about that. So uh, Paul highlights these two children. Um, we're going to be in Galatians 4, right there, verse 21. And he... Um, he says a couple of crazy things. I'm going to say it differently. He says, basically, uh, number one, the gospel makes anyone who believes in Jesus a child of God. That's one crazy thing. He says the gospel makes anyone who believes in Jesus a child of God. It's that simple. Uh, the false teachers say it's not that simple. You have to do so much to then be loved. That's what religion says today. And so that's one thing. The second thing he says is the most proud, the most moral, the most righteously able, those people are often the ones that are not part of God's family. Sounds shocking. 
Um, but it's like a flipped upside down culture within the kingdom of God. We have the world's view and we have the kingdom of God's view. And so those are a couple things that Paul highlights in different ways as we go through this, our passage today. Uh, but at the end of the day, the good news is Jesus redeems all situations. Uh, with that, I want to read the scriptures. We're going to be reading 10 verses, and then I'll go back through it and explain some of it along the way. All right. Let us read Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31. <clears throat> Father, we, uh, we invite you to simplify this passage. We invite you to grace us with your presence. We invite you to use this information to grow our faith. We invite you to uh, bless our time and this space. We pray protection and covering over this time and space. I ask God that you would bring peace to each and every person in this room and those who are watching online. Uh, that they would be able to trust you in the hardships that they may be going through, trust you in the situations that may be stressful, things that may seem out of control or unredeemable. I pray we can have trust in you and peace. So we uh, give you this time and space and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Paul says here, he continues, uh, tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai, where people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia, because she and her children live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. Verse 27, as Isaiah said, Old Testament prophet, Rejoice, O childless woman, you who have never given birth. Break into a joyful shout, you who have never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. But you are now being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. But what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of of the free woman. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, now that that's clear as mud, right? Let's uh, talk about this a little bit. Um, Paul's doing something very interesting here. Uh, if you've heard the term rhetoric, he's a good rhetorician. He is arguing his point to communicate, hoping to convince people of something. And so, uh, what Paul is doing, I use the terminology gospel fluency. Now, in short, the gospel is the person in the work of Jesus. The gospel is Jesus himself and everything he accomplished for us, his life, 
his death, his resurrection, his ascension. He sent the Holy Spirit to live in people who believe. And then he promised to come back again. All of that is encompassed in the term work, okay? So the gospel is the person of Jesus and the work of Jesus. And gospel fluency is this idea or concept, the ability to take any theme or passage or concept and tie it to Jesus, point it to Jesus, right? And Paul's doing that here. So for example, if I'm talking to a student about the greatest teacher I've ever met in my life, I'll maybe highlight my sixth grade teacher, but then I'll point to the greatest teacher, which is Jesus. I may talk to a buddy of mine about the best spouse we could ever have, and that would be ultimately Jesus, or the best friend we can ever have, who will never forsake us, never condemn us, never leave us, is Jesus. And we could do that with any concept, any metaphor, anything. And Paul is demonstrating that in the scriptures we just read. He's using an Old Testament passage that when you read the passage, it literally doesn't say these things. But Paul is making a connection. So he's going a little deeper, hoping to take the argument of these uh, false teachers and turn it against them. And so that's what Paul's doing. So he's using two themes. Uh, one is slave woman and free woman. He's talking about two covenants. He's talking about two children, uh, Isaac and Ishmael. And so now let's read and talk a little bit more about them. All right, verse 21. Paul says, tell me. Now these are, these Gentile or these uh, uh, Galatian folk are another term for them as Gentiles, right? They're Gentiles. They're, they're people who are not Jewish. That's another term for them. And outside of that, these individuals uh, have not grown up under the law. They don't know Hebrew. They're not reading the, 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 the scrolls, right? And so Paul starts with this. These Gentiles now are living under this oppression of the law because of the false teachers. And so uh, we have verse 21. Paul says, tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? Well, they don't. They may be familiar with the Ten Commandments, but the 613 regulations, like all of them, they're not familiar with everything that God has required but they're believing what these false teachers are saying they have to do to be saved. And that's not the gospel of Jesus. And so Paul knows that, so he shares that in verse 21. Verse 22, he goes on. He says, the scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. Now I'm gonna stop there. Now, if you know the story, you may be very familiar with Isaac being the chosen son gifted by God to Sarah and Abraham. Well, if you fast forward 14 years before that, what did Sarah and Abraham do? They, they, they thought that God needed their help to bring about this promised son that God promised. So Sarah says that Abraham, ultimately under Abraham's authority and leadership, you know, God put got to put pressure where the pressure is, right? So Abraham says to Sarah, yeah, that's a great idea. I will have relations with your servant woman. And maybe that's what God wants. Uh, and so Ishmael is born, right? And so that's what happens. So we're very familiar with Isaac and we're very familiar with Ishmael. Two religions today still can trace back to those two individuals. I'll mention that in a little bit. But if we don't remember Genesis chapter 25, actually Abraham, after Sarah dies, has six more sons. But Paul doesn't refer to that because it's not really important to his argument. So what we're getting into right now is very specific by Paul. And he's going to say some things in a moment that may not be biblical in your mind or eyes or understanding. But what Paul's trying to do is make an argument to prove a point. And so 
he says, he highlights the two of eight sons that Abraham had, and he may have had more that aren't mentioned here, and there's probably daughters Abraham had that aren't mentioned here either. But Paul is referring to two, and he's linking one to a free woman and one to a slave woman. And he mentions they're both his wives, so literally, Sarah was his wife, and, and Hagar was the slave woman or servant woman. So they both have children, and then there was tension in the home. So that's verse, uh, let's see, where were we? Verse 22. Uh, the son, uh, this is verse 23 now, the son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born of God's own fulfillment of his promise. So Paul's continuing to exercise gospel fluency, taking concepts and pointing them to Jesus, pointing them to the covenant of God's grace, the gospel. And so I, I put together this uh, a little uh, slide here, hoping to understand, because there's a lot being communicated here. And so the, uh, Abraham has been given a promise. We know about that in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, he will have a son. This is what God said. And Abraham's married to Sarah, known as Sarai at the time. And they have this servant girl. There are probably many servants, but this one is highlighted, Hagar, because of obvious reasons. And Paul is using the term slave and free on purpose. He ties, he then ties this slave and free woman uh, to a specific location. And then he ties Sarah, the free woman, to a specific location. Let's read that. These two women serve as an illustration. So Paul's going into an illustration um, of, let's see, of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai, where people received the law that enslaved them. And he goes on to explain, and now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia because she and her children live in slavery to the law. So he's describing Hagar and that whole left column there. And the Jews still are in that slavery at this time Paul's referring to. And verse 25, and now Jerusalem is just like, okay, I read that because, okay, verse 26. Uh, but the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. Oh, so beautiful. That's so beautiful. So um, Paul is saying Hagar, the slave woman, is tied to where they receive the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments is something we should all still live by. It's not like they're bad. It's not bad. I mean, it's a good thing to not um, lie. It's a good thing to not kill people it's a good thing to not steal and so the law given literally at mount sinai was really good to live by paul's not saying don't live by that what paul is saying is don't live under that meaning don't be uh, enslaved by it where you need to live it fulfill it to be accepted and loved by god he says don't do that um, so he's, he's saying those who are connected to Mount Sinai, Hagar, uh, her child, Ishmael, uh, the law, uh, Jerusalem of his day, they're still enslaved by that pressure that they got to live in and obey these things to be accepted and loved by God. He's saying that's slavery. What I've shared with you in regards to the gospel is freedom. And he's connecting that to Sarah, who's free, and he says there's a heavenly Jerusalem. And then he ties it to this mother. She's a mother and family instead of slavery and slave, right? Slave relationship. There's this mother-family relationship. And so Paul's highlighting those things. All right. Um, let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on. Before I read on, I want to share a little bit more and unpack this a little bit more, actually. So Abraham, same, same title there, <clears throat> We have Hagar, and in this situation, literally Abraham and Sarah 
took it in their own capabilities, their own hands. God gave a promise. God fulfills his promises. And they took it in their own hands to say, I think God needs our help. Their own capabilities. Moments. So, so uh, Abraham's had faith, but he had faith in his self-work. I need to do this to fulfill God's promise. There's no different t- today. There's still people in religion. There's still people in the world who feel like they need to do to be loved and accepted by God. And so the flip side of that is Sarah, who relied on God, right? This is according to the story Paul is sharing. And relying on God, there's faith in God's work. Now, I'm going I'm I'm to step over here for a second. I'm going to step outside of Paul's argument to make sure we're clear on something. Hagar is kind of being painted in a bad light in this whole scenario. Between me, you, the video camera, and whoever's watching and listening, Hagar is like an innocent bystander this whole time. Just so you know, just for the record, Hagar is just an obedient servant who's obeying. And in this, um, uh, she went through a lot of hardship, okay? And Sarah is being painted as the righteous one, the one favored by God, when she, in the story, is the literal faithless one. Meaning, she had faith in God, but she felt like maybe I'm supposed to bring something to the table, an idea, a concept, because I'm still barren. She probably still, underneath her barrenness, has a weight of, what have I done in my sin? Like, what have I done wrong? I'm, and she doesn't have a child until she's 90. So there's 90 years of self-condemnation, cultural condemnation. Imagine her going to grocery outlet and she's going to get her eggs and cheap almond butter and people are looking at her like she's the one. She's still barren. Something's wrong with her. And so, but in the story of what Paul's trying to communicate, he's highlighting Sarah and the, the covenant with God, trusting God, relying on God, and Hagar, the one who doesn't. And so, slave free. So he's, he's highlighting those things. But we know when we trust in our own capabilities, I know personally, specifically when I shared my testimony earlier, I trusted myself. God needs my help to get to my appointment on time. So I justified in my own eyes to drive fast, to run stop line stoplights, stop signs, and a stoplight because God needed my help because I needed to fix the situation and I was confronted with my sin. I was operating in myself and my own capabilities. My daughter sitting in the passenger side who's 17, I'm indirectly discipling her to not trust God when time is at a crunch. It's not good. And she was sitting there relying on God, trusting God. It'll be okay. We can trust God. He controls the situation. So Paul's communicating this. Every time we rely on self, it's going to end up in a disaster. Anytime we live outside of God's will, it's going to end up in a disaster. Ask any 15-year-old who has a child, ask anyone, like whatever, anytime we step outside of God's grace and how he says it ought to look or live by, it ends up being in a disaster. Not to say that newborn child from a 14-year-old woman uh, is sinful, beautiful gift from God. But it's a disaster. A lot of hardship comes. A lot of weight under that circumstance comes because of that. So anytime we have self-salvation, salvation by performance, it ends up being a disaster in many ways, spiritually, physically, psychologically, emotionally. It's hardship when we live outside of God's will. <clears throat> I want to... I want to hit another slide to go a little further with this. Hagar, her son Ishmael, is communicated. There's this self-reliance, this self-righteousness. In this storyline, there's this, my performance is what saves me. On the flip side, Paul's arguing Sarah, Isaac was her son, is 
resting in his righteousness, God's righteousness, and trusting in Jesus' work, Jesus, who he is, his birth, his life, his death. That's ultimately where the trust lies and where God calls us to trust in, in, in that. Now I want to read our, uh, the next part of our passage. Verse 27. Uh, Paul continues and he quotes an Old Testament verse, Isaiah 54, verse 1. Isaiah said, Rejoice, O childless woman, you who have never given birth, break into a joyful shout. You who have never been in labor, for the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And so in this passage, it's what's beautiful about this. It doesn't say this, but what's beautiful about this connected to Sarah is that God redeems all situations. God redeemed the barren woman. He blessed the barren woman in a culture that says, you're a barren woman. There's something wrong with you. God says, there's nothing wrong with her. Watch this. And he blesses her at 90 years old. God redeems every situation. And so he did that here for this barren woman, brought a child who then will bless the whole world. What's so cool about that is if the barren woman is able to be redeemed, so is the outcast, the foreigner, the sinner, the broken, the one who's down and out. He's able to redeem me. He's able to redeem you in all of our situations He's a redeeming God. This, uh, there's a story um, I'll share after I explain the barren woman. I'm going to explain the barren woman real quick, and then I'll share this story. So, barren woman, we have Hagar Ishmael. She's not barren. She is looked at as good and valued, and um, judged is the end result in Paul's story. On the flip side, we have Sarah and Isaac, who there, she was a barren woman, and she was looked at as a sinful sinner, failure, and she was ultimately redeemed. We see Hagar is judged in the story for what's going to take place in verse 28 and 29 when she and Ishmael were cast out. They were ultimately judged and sent away. So the story connected to this barren woman uh, goes like this. There was this German woman. You may or may not know the history or this story. This German woman lived in the Harlem area, New York area, Manhattan. And she, this took place in the early 1900s, like 1917. And she uh, was a lover of God. This German woman was a lover of God and she really trusted his voice and really pressed into him to be guided um, to do what she felt God calling her to do. She felt God was calling her to start a Bible study. So she started a Bible study. She led this Bible study. The first two women on the scene were these two black women from Harlem. They showed up in this Bible study. Very quickly, these women heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and realized this is really good news and believed, placed faith in Christ and were saved. They were redeemed. Their situation and hardship. In this, if you remember what happens in our country in the early 1900s for people of color, it's not a good thing, right? Their situation may not be redeemed, but they spiritually and for eternity were redeemed by faith in Christ. And so this little Bible study is taking place. This woman from Germany felt led into this and is starting to see fruit as her new friends are joining this Bible study. She is on cloud nine. She uh, goes home. She wants nothing more in the world than to get married and have children. All right? That theme of barrenness and value with women, it continues and it continues today, you know? Uh, this idea of weight on our performance. And so she goes home to this um, storyline. She's engaged to be married to a man. They're not living together. She's engaged to be married to a man. And he says to her, shockingly, if you don't stop this Bible study, I'm going to call off the wedding. 
he was not happy at all that she was meeting with the people she was meeting with. And so she was put in a predicament. Do I keep walking and obeying what I believe God is calling me into and leading this Bible study? Or do I and lose my, my future husband and dreams, that kind of thing? Or do I uh, go and get married and cut this Bible study? And she read this verse. Rejoice, O childless woman, you who have never given birth, break into a joyful shout, you who have never been in labor, for the desolate woman now has more children than this other woman. She was so encouraged. She said goodbye to her fiance as she continued to live out this Bible study. This Bible study still exists today in a church community, a, a, a Pentecostal church community that's 80% African American in Harlem today called Bethel Gospel. And I'm so thankful she obeyed God and continued to walk in his grace. And she has way more spiritual children than any physical children that she would have been blessed with. And um, just super encouraged by, by that, which fits this idea that Sarah, this barren woman, this weight, God redeems every situation. So verse 28. <clears throat> verse 28 says, And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promised, just like Isaac. So he's talking to the people that make up the Galatian church communities. You believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. By faith, you're connected to Isaac. You receive the full inheritance that Isaac received. But you are now being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law just as Ishmael, the child born of the human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the spirit, by the power of the spirit. So he, I, I, I hope I put another set up here for us to see. Okay, yes. So basically he's, he's paralleling the people who are religious, who say you have to do, you have to be good, you have to be morally good, you have to, this sin management concept, you have to do all these right things, then you're accepted and loved by God. He's saying, that's, that's the Hagar, that's Ishmael, that's children of the law. He says, no, they, they, they tend to persecute others. People who are religious persecute me for preaching in a hat. People who are religious judge my arms and never eat with me again. That's what happens in my life. These are real stories in my life. It's like, no, this is not what saves me. This is why I do this. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ saves me. What has equipped me to be here is the Holy Spirit. It's not education. It's not anything except God's grace upon man. I can't tell you more that the gospel is what saves us. And it's faith in Christ and the work he's done on the cross, through the cross, in the grave, outside the grave. That's what redeems every one of us and our situations. If you are in a mess in your life, evaluate, where's my faith? Where's my effort? Where's my energy being placed? Is it the law? Is it this persecution? Is it religiosity? Where is it? Because we could be two types of people here, or three. We could be the religious here that are coming with judgment because the religious judge. Or we could be those who are living by grace and walking by faith and experiencing freedom. Or we could be non-religious, feeling like we're being judged. We could be one of those three people. And here, Paul's addressing the religious or saying, you have to do this but you're already free. You already belong to Isaac. These false teachers came into the churches, the church communities in Galatia, and they were saying, and they were using probably this story, which is why Paul used this story. They were saying, if you want to be children of Isaac and Abraham, you have to be circumcised. You have to do these things, then you'll be accepted by God and you'll be children of God. And it wasn't just by faith in Christ. 
And Paul says, no, these people who think they're children of Isaac are not. They're not children of Isaac. They are children of Ishmael. And now literally they're, they're probably children of Isaac, but he's talking spiritually speaking. These people are children of my illustration, Ishmael. Today, the Ishmael line, this Islamic line is still connected to Abraham through that line. And we have Isaac and the Jews and then Christians, this Sarah Isaac lineage. And so here Paul is continuing this argument of, of a religious and gospel of grace. And, and I think then he talks about the religious ones do persecute. They do judge. Who else, if you think of two brothers or two people, who else was judged and persecuted? Who were the first judged and persecuted ones? The very beginning of the scriptures, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel, if we were to put them up there, uh, Abel would be the Isaac and Cain would be the Ishmael, the one who judged his brother, the one who was upset, the one who did these things and didn't feel like he had justice and by, from God. And so he judged, he persecuted, he killed his brother. The next ones I think about is, there's many, but the next ones I fast forward to is the older brother, younger brother, and the prodigal son. The older brother is the religious one. I did all these things. I did all this work, and he's persecuting the younger brother who went astray, who was brokenhearted, who was at the end of himself. He says, I, and I've done this, and you've given me nothing. That's the older brother mindset. But the next one I think of is the greatest brother, and that's Jesus who is the one who is ultimately persecuted by the religious brother. The religious says, no. Jesus, I guarantee if Jesus was here today, the religious would judge him. We'd be no different. The religious would judge Jesus. And we see that ultimately, God is calling us to do something to the voice that persecutes He's telling, what are you supposed to do to the voice that persecutes? So here he gives the illustration. He says, um, but what do the scriptures say about that, about the persecuted son? The when, when, when. Now, now, there's one verse in scripture. There's one verse in scripture that says um, that there was hardship on Isaac in Genesis. There was hardship on Isaac because of this tension in the home with Isaac and Sarah, and I can't even put myself in the same shoes. Like, just imagine real life stuff. Two women in the house, two kids, one dad, just a disaster. There's a reason why scripture says that's not a good idea. But this situation early on came out of self-plan. And so God says, Hagar, Ishmael, off you go, cast them out. And that's what's happening in this next verse. Now, God's grace, just so you know, God's grace was still on Hagar. Still in Hagar, which is why we still see her lineage today. His grace was on her. He knew she was just this you know, slave individual in this home. And so Paul goes, Paul goes on, he says, get rid of the slave and her son. For the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. Paul is saying very clearly, you, you are not a product of Ishmael, though you've been told you need to do. You're a product, product of Isaac by faith. And he's talking about Gentiles, people who are not even Jewish. Like, remember the big picture here. These Jewish people come in, false teachers say to these Gentiles, you need to become Jewish, you need to do Jewish things, then you'll be accepted and loved. And Paul's saying, no, you're from the lineage of Isaac. That's huge. That's huge here. And so we often ask four questions uh, in our congregation. Who is God? What has he done? Who are we and how should we live? And we've been playing with a fifth one. So what does that look like? How does that get played out? What do we do now, right? And so um, <clears throat> I don't have the questions up here. I should have put the questions up here. But in, if you guys just look at the passage, I want you to look at the passage, just the end. It says, but verse 30 and 31, that answers 
one or two of the questions. And I'd like us to piece together the rest of the questions. But what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son. For the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the, sl- the free woman's son. So dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. Who is God? Doesn't answer that. What has he done? It doesn't answer that. Who are we? It answers that. Uh, How should we live? It doesn't really answer that. But what should we do? It answers that. All right. If I had these questions on the board, it would make more sense and people could answer those better. So um, who are we in this, these two verses? Those who have placed faith. I say we as if we share all the same faith. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you are like among these Gentile people or uh, Galatian folk, um, who are they? Who are we? That, anybody want to answer that? We're free. Children of the free woman. We're children of the free woman. We're children of God. We're children of the free woman. We're, we're on the side where there was no condemnation. We're on the side of those who rely on God and his work. His work is miraculous. Our work is... If I were to fix the burnt building next door, our work would be borrowing $2 million already, folks. And we'd be in $2 million of debt. Then I'd have to change the way I preach because I want more people here on a Sunday. And I'd have to be funnier or I have to have something that makes you feel good and not convicted. And if that happens, then more people will be here and then I could raise more money and we could pay off the debt that I got us in. Right? But we're not going to borrow money. We're going to wait on the Lord. He's going to do the miraculous thing. He's going to do the Sarah thing. He's going to do the, the, the Jesus thing. He was born from a woman who didn't even have a husband yet. God works through the miraculous. So we are the children of God. Okay, what should we do? What does it say we should do? Live as free ones is how we should live. The fifth question says, cast out, get rid of the slave. So whatever voice is in your life, That is, as speaking non-gospel messages, get that out of your head. We may be sitting here today. I want you guys to hear me. If I could stand on this, I would. If, wow, this feels really good to be this tall. Man, I look, I feel like I'm looking down on you. Just kidding, just kidding, I won't judge you. What was I gonna say? Dang. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you. I know. I, yeah, I love the warriors. So um, there's some of us sitting here today who are listening to messages online, Mess- listening to Christian messages online, and we may really like the message. And if we don't have discernment around what we're listening to online, we could be listening to a false gospel message. We could be building our values. We could be building our, our, our lives around these messages we're hearing online and it's not the gospel of Jesus. We have to be careful with what we're tickling our ears with. So that's something we may need to evaluate and cast out of our lives. What other voices, this, these are voices from the false teachers. There's another voice. Whatever voice we might be getting from political websites or news sources, whether it's right or left, we need to be careful because oftentimes those start to change how we view God. We start to live through a political lens and link it to the gospel. We have to be careful with that because that's not what Jesus did. That's not what the scriptures do. We live by the gospel and everything else gets filtered through that. It's very easy to flip that. And so be careful with what we're listening to. And there's many other voices, friends, people. I don't know what we're reading, men, women. I don't know what we're reading, what we're looking at. Be careful with what we are receiving as the solution. And we need to cut that out. We need to cast that out. That's what we should do. How we should live is free people. Who are we? We are free. If you have faith in Jesus, you're a free child of God. That's simple. That's simple. Now I'm going to say something about that. Religion is exclusive. Religion and the philosophies of the world are very exclusive. And they say... You need to be moral, you need to do, you need to be right, you need to be righteous, and then you're accepted. That's what religion says. That's what philosophies say. 
But the gospel is just as exclusive, if not more. It says uh, you have to be um, weak. You have to be humble at the end of yourself, not relying on your own strength. Understand that you're broken and messed up and need someone, something outside yourself to save yourself. That's what the gospel says. And, but between the two, if I'm not good enough, like I could walk into a religious setting, a philosophical setting, and I feel less than. I don't feel like I'm, I cut, I can make the cut. And oftentimes when I find myself in certain meetings, I don't feel like I belong there. But the gospel, even though it's exclusive, it's the most inclusive because anyone, regardless of your background, regardless of what you've done, regardless of anything, if you believe in Christ Jesus, you can be saved. It's the most, and it's just like that. You don't have to change anything. In that moment, you come to realize you're at the end of your rope. You try to live, you try to control your life, and you mess your life up. I release all that, and I trust in Jesus, and you're redeemed instantly. So inclusive. Okay, sorry. Back to the questions. Okay, how, what we should do is cast out, cut out all those uh, things that are leading us away from Jesus. Uh, how we should live is free people. Who are we? We are free people. What has God done? And who is God according to those, the rest of those answers? What has God done if we're free people? He's freed us. He set us free. I want someone to share the gospel with me. Share the gospel with me. I'm not going to tell you. I've been saying it all day. What is the gospel? How has God freed us? Somebody. Anybody. Salvation. Salvation. Talk to me about that. How did he do it? How did God the Father save us? So God the Father sent the Son who became that penalty. Yep. Our ransom. So Jesus, God the Father, sent Jesus the Son. Jesus the Son lived just like us, human flesh. He met us where we're at. And he lived a sinless life, died a perfect death on our behalf. He was the perfect ransom. He was that perfect lamb of God. This is what God did to save us. All right, who is God? The Savior. The Rescuer. Now, doesn't that make you want to worship him? I want to worship the Savior, the Rescue One. I want to live and honor him. And when you have that heart posture, you will obey the Ten Commandments because you love him, Amen. not to be saved by. When you get to Jesus, when you get to God, when you, and I want to ask you, ask those four questions every time you read your Bible, you'll find yourself worshiping God just like that. You'll find Jesus in Exodus. You'll find Jesus in Leviticus and Numbers. Ask those four questions, you'll get to Jesus. Father, I thank you for being the Savior. Father, I thank you for being the Rescuer. I thank you, God, for being the Sovereign One over Ishmael and Isaac, over Sarah and Hagar. Hagar. I pray, Lord, over each and every one of us here today that, one, we understood and heard the gospel. I pray we're encouraged that the gospel is a free gift for all people to believe. I pray, Lord, that we are able to see you for who you are, not see you through a religious lens and what religion says. Religion tends to be judging, but you are a God of freedom. I thank you for giving us that free gift and making us free people instantly through your grace and our faith. We bless you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.